The Real Historical Patrick. I welcome you to the program. The Real Patrick needs to be heard in his own words and in the deeds that he did when he evangelized Ireland for 60 years uh, from his youth up to when he was in his 90s. And it needs to be heard. This I did when I made a video, which you will be seeing shortly. The video gives his exact words from his testimony and it gives the deeds that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit as he preached God's grace in the true gospel. And it's amazing what was achieved in that island during the course of his ministry. At the end of his days, there were 365 churches established and they were true biblical churches. Ireland was a Christian nation, basically, when Patrick died. And after his death, the heritage of Patrick, that Christian faith, continued for over 600 years. Many evangelists were sent out to other parts of Europe and it was an island known as the Island of Saints and Scholars. And it was really an island that was the Christian nation of Ireland for those 600 years after Patrick lived. I had the privilege in October 2013 to tour Ireland on a preaching tour where I went to many churches in the south and north and I was amazed at how many churches had grown, solid Christian biblical churches in the south and some more new ones in the north. I was amazed and uh, it was a real encouragement to my heart to see many, many people had come to the Lord in that my own Ireland. There was a re-establishment of Christian faith there and it was real encouragement to me. One of the topics I preached on was the real, the authentic historical Patrick. And I was amazed at how many people did not understand. They did not understand that how it happened that a nation that had been Christian for over 600 years could, in the matter of a few weeks, in the year 1172, change from being a Christian nation to being a Roman Catholic nation. 1172. How did it all happen? It began in the year 1155 when the Pope Adrian IV, he was the only British Pope by birth British, this Adrian IV sent a decree, an order, to King Henry II of England that he was to conquer Ireland and bring the whole territory under the rule of England. And then he was to take the pastors and leaders of the churches and to get them to submit to Roman Catholic belief. And it is a horrendous history. The decree that Pope Adrian IV wrote, you can see a copy of it online at Yale University in the historical section and you will see on your webpage the URL that goes to that historical decree that Adrian IV wrote to King Henry II. Part of what he said was, and I read from the exact text, to expedite, expedite the vices that have taken place in Ireland, that have taken root in Ireland, saving to St. Peter and the Holy Roman Church an annual pension of one penny for each house. As part of the words in that historical document, and it is, uh, it is quite 
horrendous to see how this played out. King Henry did not actually obey this command of the Pope until the year 1171. With a large army, he came to Ireland and he subdued all the different counties one by one and took the island by force so that it would become part of England. It would be now not a, a, a politically free nation but would be submitted to England. And then he did in the following year, 1172, at a place called Cashel, there was a Synod of Cashel. And at the Synod of Cashel, they called all that they could find from right across the nation to Cashel, the pastors and leaders of the Christian churches. And they were compelled under force to submit to the Roman Catholicism and to come under the Pope. They were compelled under force to become Roman Catholic. And this happened and it is a heartbreak to see that it happened, but these men gave in under force that they could lose their lives if they did not submit. And that was the well-known Synod of Cashel in 1172. And then we can imagine and we hear historically how both Henry II and of course Pope Adrian IV were extremely gratified of what happened. There were further rulings and decrees from Adrian IV sent to King Henry II and they were also decrees sent to all the nobles and princes of Ireland. And these went out so that all the princes in the different parts that were now subservient to the rule of England with all these different um, leaders in the social context, these were all to know that the Irish nation was now subject to the Catholic hierarchy. They were subject to what would be called the Catholic bishops of Ireland and the Catholic priests of Ireland. And so it was in a matter of weeks in 1172 that the Christian heritage of Ireland changed from being a Christian nation to becoming a Roman Catholic nation. I was amazed in that preaching tour how many people did not understand this. And this factual historical event, which can be verified quite easily from historical documents, really opened the eyes. I saw men and women changed in my beloved Ireland as they learned the truth of what is the real heritage. The heritage of Ireland is the faith of Patrick, praise God. And we know the island has known some horrendous difficulties north and south, and I won't go into that because they're well known the conflicts that have gone in, on in Ireland. And the way that all conflicts can be solved by the Irish people is going back to the faith of Patrick, the true faith of Patrick that was utterly biblical and very vibrant and very much alive. That God is glorified and souls saved now unto all eternity in Christ Jesus. A vibrant faith. And this is what, um, this is what I spoke about in the video you're about to see. And I'm really happy that you will see this video because my heart and soul pulsate, as it were, in, in this video that you're about to see that I made some years ago. And I ask that you make this video known because 
each year as the 17th of March comes up we have Patrick's Day celebrated in many different parts of the world people thinking that Patrick was some sort of a Catholic bishop or something with a mitre on his head or something like this <laughs> when he was an evangelist with, with the Bible text in his hand going around preaching this is something that needs to be known so I ask that you make this video known and if you want to contact me you will see that I not only give on your screen the URL for the Yale University but you'll have my email address and I would love to hear from you it may take a few days before you get an answer but it is always a joy to hear from those who watch the program so may God be glorified and may be souls be saved as we remember the true historical Patrick today I want to talk to you about a person who is very dear to my heart it is the real Patrick of Ireland. I'm an Irishman and I discovered as a Bible believer who the real historical Patrick is and it, it came as an utter shocking contrast to me who grew up in Ireland and knew the traditional Patrick that I was taught as a, a young Irish boy. When I grew up uh, the celebration of Patrick's Day was a big day in Ireland where you know they drank more of the, the liquor and they celebrated their great feast and of course we prayed to Patrick he was one of the many saints we prayed to it was one day in Lent where we could break our Lenten fast and as a young boy I would give up such things as sweet drinks and chocolate and during the celebration of Paddy's Day we could uh, eat as much as we wanted and it was one day in Lent where we could really celebrate because this was our saint, our own, our own saint of Ireland, Patrick. And uh, he was the one who was supposed to cast out the snakes from Ireland and read all these legends about Patrick. And he was the one that we honoured, but we knew nothing about who the real Patrick was. It was only after my 48 years in Catholicism, my 22 years as a priest, and when I became a Bible believer, it was about six or seven years afterwards that I began really his studying the historical Patrick. And my eyes were opened because I discovered that the historical real Patrick was not a bishop of the Catholic Church. He was not a bishop of any church. He was an evangelist who came to Ireland with the doctrine of God's grace and of salvation in the person of Christ. And it is a tremendous tonic for us who grew up. I remember too as a, a young boy in my late teens, I was in the uh, reserve force of the Irish army and we had prepared for months to walk past the famous Nelson's pillar that stood in the centre of Dublin at the time before it was blown up and the GPO where the uprising had taken place in 1916 and I was in the, the famous Pierce Battalion of the FCA and I remember marching proudly past the, um, the statue of Nelson and the General Post Office in Ireland to celebrate Patrick, but I had no idea of who Patrick really was. And the, the swarming crowds that day who would come to celebrate Patrick's Day on the 17th of March had no idea who he really was. Who was Patrick? And that's what I want to discuss with you today. He wasn't an Irishman as such. He wasn't born in Ireland. He was born in Scotland. It wasn't called Scotland at the time. It was part of the Roman world, the Roman Empire, as it were, as it had extended to the British Isles. It was part of what was the Roman world at the time. It was called uh, Banava Taburie, and he had come from a Christian family. His father was a deacon. Uh, called Copernicus and his uh, grandfather 
was the late Petitus. He was a presbyter that was, was the pastor or an elder of the church. So this is the real Patrick. And he had been uh, born uh, in the year 373. And it was on the River Clyde, in, as I told you, in Roman Britain, which is now part of Scotland. And as a young boy, he was taken captive. Some pirates came by sea and they took him captive as a young youth, together with other youths, brought them on a ship from, uh, from Ireland, uh, from uh, Scotland to Ireland, and put them under a chieftain where they really were in slavery. And he was to spend six years as a slave on what turned out to be the uh, hills in Antrim, uh, whereby he was held captive. And there, when he was captive in Ireland, he began to think of some of the scriptures that was given to him as a young boy. And it was then that he came in his own life to salvation. And he admits that when he was taken captive, he did not know the Lord. To read his own words from his own testimony, we have his own words written down and we have five manuscripts preserved in different historical documents that are preserved in different places of the world. And I give details of those in the written format of what I'm speaking to you today on our web page, whereby you can get much more detail than what I'm talking to you today. But we have an historical document in his own testimony. And he says there in his own testimony quotation, I was taken captive before I knew what I should desire and what I should shun. Before he knew good and evil, before he knew that he himself was a sinner, he was taken captive. But it was on those mountain hillsides when in captivity that the Lord humbled him and he saw himself as a sinner, that he came to salvation. And again, I would like to read his own words to you. He said, before I was humbled, I was like a stone lying in a deep mire. He that is mighty came and in his mercy raised me up and indeed lifted me high up and placed me on top of the wall. And from there I ought to shout out in gratitude to the Lord for his great favors in this world and forever that we, the mind of man, can never measure. He saw that God's grace was something that we could not measure. And he saw that before he was shown what salvation was, he was lying, in his own words, in the deep mire. And then he found God's grace, and he saw that he was a debtor to God's grace. And I'd like to read to you again his own exact words. I am greatly God's debtor because he granted me so much grace. And this is the theme of Patrick's testimony. He granted me so much grace. He grew in the grace of God. He believed on the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth, and he grew from grace to grace in Christ. And he was, as it were, on fire, or he burnt within with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was so leading him. I'd like to read again his own words where he speaks about his prayer life as a young boy where he'd come to understand himself as a sinner and had seen himself in Christ by God's grace. He said, quotation, more and more did the love of God and my fear of him and faith increase and my spirit was moved so that in a day I said up to a hundred prayers and at night a like number 
Besides, I used to stay out in the forest and on the mountain, and I would wake up before daylight to pray in the snow, in the icy cold, in rain, and I used to feel neither ill nor any slothfulness, because, as I now see, the Spirit was burning in me at that time. Patrick speaking about the Holy Spirit burning within him. Then he relates in some detail in his written testimony how he escaped. It was a very difficult journey by land and sea. He was able to escape from his captivity and come back to his own Scotland, to his own parents. And I would like again to read to you his own words as he speaks about his homecoming. I was again in Britain with my family and they welcomed me as a son and asked me in faith that after great tribulations I had endured, I should not any more, or I should not anywhere else go from them. I just missed it slightly there in reading his precise words because in a certain sense I am taken up with this testimony because it, it is magnifying the grace of God and the, the spirit burning within him. And it is in a certain sense infectious that the testimony of Patrick as he reads his own words and as he read how he felt called of the Lord and how this call came to him. He was very clear to interpret his call in the light of scripture and he speaks about it in very graphic words, so much so that I think that we have again to read his exact words of how he felt again urged in faith not to be true to what his parents asked him never again to leave. He felt that he should return to the very island where he had been held captive. And I read now his own precise words, and I'll try to keep precisely to his words, but it, it's difficult because of we sensed the very fire that was within him as he wrote these words. I saw a man whose name was Victoricus, coming as if it were from Ireland with innumerable letters, and he gave me one of them, and I read the beginning of the letter, the voice of the Irish, and as I was reading the beginning of the letter, it seemed at that moment, I seemed at that moment to hear the voice of those who were beside the forest of Hucklut which is near the Western Sea, and they were crying as if with one voice, we beg you, holy youth, that you shall come and shall walk again among us. And I was stung intensely in my heart, so that I could read no more. And thus I awoke. Thanks be to God because after so many years the Lord bestowed on them according to their cry. He saw that God answered the cry of these people in Ireland who were praying that he would return. And then we see in his own testimony how he interpreted these words that he, as if he heard, he interpreted by the scripture. So he went back to God's own source and authority of the written word to interpret what he sensed was the call. And so he wrote, Likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for utterance. And again, the Lord our Advocate intercedes for us. He relied on scripture and he relied on the substitutionary life of Christ Jesus who died in his place as a sinner. And this he was exquisitely clear in his testimony. He said 
quotation, but what he was sensing was this. He who gave his life for you, he it is who speaks within you. And Patrick interpreted the word that he was hearing by, as if it were the Holy Spirit speaking to him, he interpreted through the Spirit of God who had given to us the scriptures. It was the same Christ who had died for him, who was calling him by the Holy Spirit, that Patrick interpreted through the written word of God to come back and serve the people where he had been captive. Patrick, besides writing the historical document that we have of his testimony, wrote another historical document that is authenticated by many different sources, and it was his letter to Caroticus. Caroticus had been a, um, a chieftain who had robbed away and stolen some of Patrick's converts just after they had made a profession of faith and been baptized. He had stolen them away to bring them into slavery. And Patrick had written to Caroticus to want these people released again to freedom. And his letter to Caroticus where he's pleading with him to release these men and women that he had taken captivity is a masterpiece, again, in the grace of God and declaring who Patrick was, who was writing to Caroticus. And we have quotations again from this document. Uh, he speaks in the letter to Caroticus of what salvation was and why he wanted these men and women back into freedom. And I want to quote from this uh, document that we have from his own hand where he wrote to this chieftain, Caroticus. He said in his own words, I am a servant in Christ in, to a foreign nation for the unspeakable glory of life everlasting which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. He spoke about the unspeakable glory of life everlasting which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. And that is thematic of Patrick, the real Patrick. He speaks about not life in any church or in any system, but he speaks about it scripturally as it is in Christ Jesus the Lord. He, like Paul the Apostle before him, saw that salvation is not in any system, but it is in, in a person. It is in Christ Jesus. And he spoke about the salvation in Christ Jesus the Lord. And he comes back in his letter to Caroticus at the very beginning to speak about who he himself was. He begins the letter by saying, I, Patrick, a sinner, unlearned, resident in Ireland. Just as he began his testimony with the words, I, Patrick, a sinner, a most simple countryman, the least of all the faithful and most contemptible to many. Patrick speaking about seeing himself as a sinner. And this is where the grace of God is magnified because he sees himself as destitute of all meriting salvation or of any, anything worked in his own person. He saw himself as a sinner. Uh, this second historical document begins like the first one, I, Patrick, a sinner. And of everlasting life which is in Christ Jesus. And this is utterly the testimony of Patrick. So much like Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle, for example, in the letter to Ephesians, in the first two chapters, chapter 1 and 2 of Ephesians, 42 times in those first two chapters of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, Paul talks about in Christ, in him and whom, in the beloved, in different terminology, he speaks about everlasting life that is in Christ Jesus. That was the testimony of Paul. Just like the Apostle John spoke about, this is the record that everlasting life is in him, 
Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul emphasized everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And so it is in Patrick, the evangelist. Everlasting life is in Christ Jesus. And Patrick is emphatic of where life was and that it was totally saved by grace the abundance of God's grace, the riches of God's grace. And so he was looking to the person of Christ Jesus. And so his mission began in Ireland. When did it begin in Ireland? It began in the year 405. And this is a, a real important date, and it was emphasized in the ninth century by for example, Marcus, an Irish bishop, who said that uh, Patrick had come there in 405, and such as Nennius, writing in the same year. And later, the historian uh, Wiley, uh, who did research, uh, found again and again that the great historical sources, such as uh, Usher, Ware, Tillman, Lagenham, Neander, uh, Dr. Colleen being uh, emphatic that Patrick came in the year 405, uh, just after the death of Neil Neil with the nine hostages. Again and again, the historians emphasizing that Patrick came to Ireland in 405. Why is that so important? Because the legendary Patrick, the one that I grew up with, we knew very little about him, but we always said that he came to Ireland in 432. And we said that he was sent out by the Bishop of Rome in 432. That was to confuse us and to confuse Patrick with another historical uh, character called Pelagius, who was sent out by the Bishop of Rome in 432. But Patrick had been there 27 years or so previous to Palladius. And he had many churches set up in Ireland. And so he came historically, we know, from the greatest historical sources in 405. And Patrick was to spend 30 years evangelizing Ireland. And it was, uh, it was to be so successful that the um, I beg your pardon, he was 30 years old. I'm getting, I'm getting ripped up, as it were, by enthusiasts. And he was to spend 60 years in his, his work in Ireland. He started off, uh, and he was, he was spent many, many years in evangelism. He had started off about 30 years old. But he, by the end of his days, had set up about 365 churches right across Ireland. The Church of Saul, uh, which was one of the first churches where he had founded, but many other churches, and there were not church buildings as such like we would think of nowadays, small groups of believers, but right across Ireland, quite successful. When Pelagius came to Ireland in the year 432, he found that there was already a great Christian influence and he was not able to try and bring them under any bishop of Rome or any system that was not native to Ireland and in line with the written word in the scriptures, which Patrick continually quoted. His quotations are continually from the scripture, and there was nothing of sacramental ritualism in Patrick's preaching. It was all centered on the grace of Christ. And so when Palladius came, he was utterly disappointed because he could not have his message accepted. And then historically, Palladius had to leave Ireland. And he actually died in what was Scotland among the pigs. I'd like to quote to you from the historian Grafshev, where he speaks about Palladius. Quotation, Palladius was so discouraged that he soon abandoned the field 
and with his assistants for North Britain, and he died among the Picts. The Roman mission of Palladius failed. The independent mission of Patrick succeeded. He is the true apostle of Ireland and has impressed his memory in indelible characters upon the Irish race at home and abroad. And so we have Palladius, who the Roman Catholic Church tries to get Patrick mixed up with him, another distinct character, separate from Patrick, and whose mission failed. Patrick, over the course of 60 years, was utterly successful. And there's many stories of him, historical stories, uh, uh, coming up against the Druids. The Druids were a pagan form of type of mysticism and of a priest craft whereby people look to holy men to bring them uh, into the um, understanding of and experience of who God was. And it had a great hold on the people. It's a druid uh, stone um, place where they would try to have their mystical communication with the gods. And this was part of the paganism that Patrick came up against. He withstood the Druids and the priesthood and all pagan religion. And he brought in a salvation in the person of Christ Jesus by the grace of Christ Jesus. And he was one to again and again relate the grace of God to his indebtedness to who Christ Jesus is. Again, let me go back to the very words of Patrick uh, that he says, because these are words that are uplifting. Patrick's own words, I am greatly God's debtor because he has granted me so much grace that through me many people would be reborn in God that clergy would be ordained everywhere from them, and that the masses lately come to believe whom the Lord drew from the ends of the earth, as he once promised through his prophets, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth. And again, our fathers have inherited naught but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. And again, I have set you to be in a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the uttermost ends of the earth. For I wish to wait then for his promise, which is never unfulfilled, just as it is promised in the gospel. Patrick's own words, burning with life, indebted to the gospel, the grace of God. And it was this that he withstood paganism and all types of ritualism to bring people into life in Christ Jesus. Again, the burning of the spirit within him as Patrick spoke in his own testimony. I read his own words as, a, as it were on fire for the grace of God. I alone can do nothing unless he himself vouchsafes it to me. But let him search my heart and my nature. I crave enough for it, even too much, for I am ready for him to grant me that I may drink of his chalice, as he has granted to others who love him. Therefore may it never Befall me to be separated by my God from his people, whom he has won in this most remote land. I pray God that he gives me perseverance, that he will deign that I should be a faithful witness for his sake right up to the time of my passing. The same Patrick who knew the grace of God to save him, a sinner, prayed that by the grace of God he would persevere and be faithful to the end. 
and that he was. As many churches, maybe as many as 365, were set up right across the, that island. Besides the churches, Patrick set up monasteries, and it is known as the Island of Saints and Scholars, for these monasteries that Patrick set up right across the island. And there's many of these monasteries that can be discovered. You know, as an Irish man, if you go to County Kerry, to the Dingle Peninsula, and you go out on that peninsula to sea, you will find to this day some 30 ruins of different monasteries, which were historical buildings where men came aside to study the scripture, to get versed in the grace of God, so that they could go out and preach the grace of God. These men later on in their lives married and settled down. They were not monasteries in the traditional Catholic sense, whereby people look to rituals and look to their own inner life of self-worth. They were monasteries where people came aside to study the scriptures, to be on fire with the scriptures, so that they could go out and proclaim grace in Christ Jesus, the everlasting life which is in Christ Jesus, like Patrick did. And so these monasteries really equipped young men, and they became famous, so much so that the grace that was in Patrick's life continued after Patrick's own demise when he died in the Lord, it was to continue for over 700 years afterwards. That men were sent out from Ireland with the gospel of grace. Now this is what astounded me when I discovered the real Patrick. It wasn't only the glory of knowing that as an Irishman, and as an Irishman who came through the, the problems with the IRA and he knew of the, the problems in Ulster with the legally lethal so-called Protestant resistance that was onto blood. And I grew up knowing the bloody conflict that was in Ireland, and I grew up on the Irish side of the, the situation, and I knew how deadly this was. And now I know that for both sides of the conflict that we call the orange and the green, the orange representing the Protestant side of the orange men and the green, the Irish side, and Catholicism, that our true heritage as Irish men is Patrick, before there was any division in Ireland. And it is the doctrines of grace. And this was not only true for the 60 years of Patrick's own preaching and teaching, but for 700 years after Patrick, that the monasteries were like the monasteries of the Valdois and the Waldenses in Europe, in southern France and in northern Italy, where we had monasteries of men set up to preach the gospel. This was the type of monasteries that Patrick founded. And from these monasteries, we had men going forth, and men with famous names, but these were not traditional Irish saints, these were evangelists like, like Patrick. And I hope one day that we will have shows showing the historical character of each of these men, because they're all stories in themselves of the grace of God. And we could document the life of some of the men that I'm now to mention, because they were historical characters that preached the gospel of God's grace, just like Patrick did. We had Columba, the famous Columba, who set out for Scotland in the year 563. We had distinct from him, Columbanus, uh, who set out to evangelize France, Germany, in the year 
612, we had Killian and his brothers who set out for Franconia in the year uh, 680, and we had Fernanan in the 10th century in 970, setting out with 12 brothers to preach the gospel on the Belgian frontier. We had that's just a sample of some of these men. And each one of these are historical characters in themselves. Like Columbanus is famous for not only preaching the gospel of grace, but withstanding the papacy in his own days. And they withstood it not just on the true date of, of Easter, which is one of the contentions they had, but the main contention of what was the true gospel. And so Columbanus withstood in his own day uh, Romanism that was growing up and ritualism. And he has an historical character on his own ground. And I long one day to do just a, a presentation on Columbanus because there is so much historical material on that one man and how he not only proclaimed the gospel of grace, but in his own day withstood ritualism. And uh, he was mightily in the biblical tradition of Patrick. And it was the gospel of grace, of the everlasting life that is in Christ Jesus, that went forth from this island of Ireland for these many, many years. We're not talking about one century or two centuries, we're talking about seven centuries after Patrick of true biblical faith going forth and to evangelize Europe. And there are some books written uh, and, um, about how the civilization of Europe in many ways depended on the missionaries that came from Ireland. That with the gospel came a liberation, of course, from pagan religions and from the religion of, of Roman Catholicism uh, and a freedom to see life in Christ Jesus. And it was a liberation so that people began to lead moral lives. And a lot of civilization is due to the, um, the gospel of grace. And so we have some books written just on how civilization was um, was changed by the um, by the grace of Christ Jesus. Some of the missionaries went forward with the gospels, and the gospels had come so that they were shown on pages with magnificent artwork, and we have the gospels proclaimed in their own words in the Book of Kells with some of the most magnificent artwork that has ever been produced. The famous Book of Kells that was written in Ireland where by from the 6th century the evangelists went forth with the written word and they showed the same written word in magnificent art. And so we had the wonderful mission of Patrick. Now, how did it change? How could this nation on fire with the gospel, on fire with life in Christ Jesus, utterly clear that salvation is in a person by the grace of God, with such wonderfully wonderful evangelists for so many years, how could this heritage, as it were, be embezzled? How could it be downplayed, and how was it taken from our Irish people? And this is a, a sad story, and I can only give an overview of it today, and uh, I asked for his, more historical research, but it, it really came in the ninth century, where the Danes came to Ireland and started to overrun the nation, and they were bringing in with them Roman Catholicism, and trying to get the elders and pastors of churches to accept the Roman Catholic form of Christendom.
they were not very successful, but there was some temptation, and some of the churches began to veer towards this type of Christianity that was known as Roman Christianity that was subservient to the Bishop of Rome. Uh, that was not really successful. It wasn't until the famous Pope Adrian IV, it wasn't until he made up his mind as Pope that Ireland was to be brought into servitude that Ireland was to change from being a biblical nation to becoming under the thumb of Roman Catholic Church. Pope Adrian issued a decree to King Henry II of England that he was to bring Ireland under servitude. I'm quoting to you from the Yale University webpage where they give the historical document mm -hmm. that was uh, from uh, the Pope to King Henry and his charge was, quotation, to extirpate the vices that have taken root in Ireland, saving to St. Peter and the Holy Roman Church an annual pension of one penny for each house. It wasn't just that Ireland was to be brought under the thumb of the Roman Catholic Church, but they were to pay Peter's pence. That was, they were to pay a tax that was to go back to the Church of Rome. And uh, King Henry was authorized to invade Ireland, to take over as a dominion, as part of England, and to bring the Irish churches under subservience to the Church of Rome. And he was commissioned to do this by Adrian in the year 1155, and we have the historical document. He was not able to carry out this commission until the year 1171. 1171 was the year of disaster because his troops came and under the king they succeeded in bringing the different kingdoms. Ireland wasn't united under one kingdom, but he brought the different kingdoms under the kingship of the king of England. And then in the following year, 1172, they had a church meeting at Cashel, the famous Synod of Cashel, where the pastors and elders of different churches were commanded to attend and it was demanded of them that they give their, their submission to the Church of Rome, that they would be accountable to the, the Church of Rome. And for the most part, with very few exceptions, the pastors gave in because it was a matter literally of life and death and they gave in to this political pressure and we had the churches that before had been biblical now were told that they could continue to preach like they did of old but more and more it was demanded of them that baptism was now no longer like Patrick Columbanus, Killian, Bernanan, and the others saw it as a profession of faith. It was to become an instrument by which people came to life, or so-called life, and they came under the ritualism and sacramentalism of Rome. And that is, it is real sad, and it really breaks my heart to say these things, and it's, it is very, very difficult to to say these things, it was, um, again, historically, um, we have the transcripts of Pope Alexander III, who succeeded uh, Adrian IV, recognizing the success of the mission and that Ireland had been brought under subjection 
to the Kingdom of Britain under Henry II and under subservience to the Bishop of Rome. Now, what hope have we and what is the hope for the nation? The hope for the nation is that we have discovered again the historical pattern. We have discovered that he was a man of God's grace. We are unraveling the true history of Columbanus, Columba, Killian, and the many other evangelists who went forth from Ireland. And our real heritage as Irish men and Irish women is the gospel of grace. And this is what I want to share with you today. And if I'm saying it with a, an urgency, it's because I feel I'm very much an Irishman, very much conscious that I was born in Ireland, grew up in Ireland. Uh, I was taught the Irish language, and my Irish culture is, as it were, in my blood. And now I can say I'm proud to be an Irishman because my legacy, my heritage, is the gospel of grace in the one who brought the gospel to Ireland in the year 405 and proclaimed the gospel right across Ireland for 60 years. And the same gospel of grace that went forth from this island for over 700 years. This is the legacy and this is where we have to be found. And this is where many men and women have come to. Peggy O'Neill is an Irish woman. She had grown up in Ireland. She wanted to serve the Catholic Church because in serving the Catholic Church, she thought she was serving Jesus Christ. And she served as a religious sister for 50 long years. 50 years as a sister. And then she discovered what was in the gospel and in the pages of the gospel as it's shown in Romans chapter 3, the righteousness of God revealed in Romans 3. From faith to faith, manifest that it is by faith we are saved and that it is by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. She saw that salvation was in a person and not in a church. And she came to salvation in her 70s, after 50 years as a nun. And she is an example of living faith in the person of Christ Jesus. Somebody who's come into a rightful inheritance as an Irish woman. And she glories now in salvation in Christ like Patrick. I got speaking to Peggy O'Neill in 2003 in a western town in Ireland and to see the tears in her eyes as she shared about her just rejoicing in salvation the person of, of, of Christ Jesus and of her glorying in the fact of the legacy that she had as an Irish woman in the heritage of Patrick, who knew the gospel of grace. And there are many, many more. There are literally millions of men and women across the globe, of those of us who were in rituals, and those of us who were bound in religion, who have now been set forth. And this is what we want to talk to you today about. In some certain sense, I was the least of all the brethren because I was you know, Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic. I lived Roman Catholicism and I lived it for 48 years and I lived it as a Dominican priest for 22 years. And who am I to speak? But I was, as it were, born of a due season. But I have, since my conversion, come in contact with so many men and women that in a certain sense I feel obliged to speak for them. I have met them in different parts of the world. And we have come out by our thousands of a system to salvation in a person and to understanding 
of the riches of grace, of the person of Christ Jesus. That we can talk like Patrick of the everlasting life that is in Christ Jesus. We're not talking about any church. We're talking about everlasting life in a person. And that's what I want to share with you today. If you are to be free from all religion, whether it is orange or green in the traditional colours of Ireland, where it's not in any system, it's in a person, it is the life in Christ Jesus. If the Son will set you free in Christ Jesus' words in John's Gospel, chapter 8, you shall be free indeed. If Christ Jesus sets you free, you will know salvation in a person. And that's what Patrick stood for. And that's what men and women have come to drink deeply of the doctrine of God's grace. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the grace of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Quoting the famous words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. And how do you and I get there? How do you and I get to the position of where Patrick was and where many thousands of men and women have come to? How do you get there? It's the starting off place that Patrick emphasized in his letter to Caroticus and in his own testimony called the Confession that where did he start? I, Patrick, a sinner. That's where we all have to start. It was the beginning of my own conversion. It was Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You being dead in trespasses and sin. You, like Patrick, like myself, like so many thousands of others, have to realize that spiritually you're devoid of grace. It's not only that you're weak or wounded, but that you are spiritually dead in trespasses and sin. Spiritually, you can do nothing. Now, that's not bad news. That is good news, because if you understand that, you look not within your human heart. You look to the person of Christ Jesus, because in him is the fullness of grace. And as you look to him, he is graciousness. And there's a superabundance of grace. And the, the words of Paul in chapter 3, verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, being justified freely by his grace, come alive before you. You see that, yes, as I realize that I'm spiritually dead, I can come to life in the person of Christ. And this is the essence of what Patrick said everlasting life which is in Christ Jesus. This is the message and this is the, the burning fire I read early on of Patrick speak about the spirit burning within him. It was to communicate to you the everlasting life that is in Christ Jesus. If you are to know everlasting life, it is to know it in a person. In the words of the Apostle John, as he summarizes at the end of John chapter 1, and we know that uh, everlasting life has come, and it is in him who is true, even in Christ Jesus the Lord. This is everlasting life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Just as John proclaimed the gospel of grace, he pleaded with the people to keep themselves from anything else. He called it idolatry because thus it is, if we look anywhere else than in Christ Jesus, we're into idolatry. We're holding up an institution or a system or rituals and not the grace of Christ. That is the message and the heartbeat of Patrick. That was the heartbeat of Columba, Killian, Fernando. That was the heartbeat of Columbanus as they went forth from Ireland to evangelize Europe. And that will be your heartbeat as you come into life in Christ Jesus, that you will find the urgency 
that in your very being you want to proclaim the gospel because you have come to understand what grace is. And then you can truly, like Patrick, say, I, Patrick, a sinner. You can give your own first name and know that you've been saved by grace. And I thank God that I can share this with you this evening or this morning, wherever you are watching or looking. And I ask that we would hear from you because the urgency to explain the grace of God is with an urgency that we give praise and glory to him as we find out more and more. And the encouragement it is to know that the harvest is great and while the laborers are few, many come to believe and it's always a great encouragement that we know that the legacy of Patrick is being lived because more people are coming to salvation. And so we praise the living God and we finish with those exact words of Patrick, the everlasting life which is in Christ Jesus. And to him be praise, glory, worship, and honor. Now and forever. To be the Lord.